Good morning. And happy Easter. The Easter season continues among us. And today in particular, in this fifth Sunday of Easter, it's a time of joy. It's a day of joy. A day to celebrate joy and to experience God's joy in our hearts. Jesus said in the gospel, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that that joy may be full, maximum joy. As he says in another place, not that the world can give, the joy that we have comes from God can only come from Him. It's a total different dimension based on a totally different foundation than what the world calls joy. In the psalm reading, it talks about how we should have joy before Him. Let even nature itself shout for joy before the Lord, as well as we, His people, His chosen people. Psalm reading this morning shows us the ways of God. It shows us God's motus operandi. It shows us how God does things in regard to us, His people. It says that, first of all, starting in verse 2, the Lord has made known His salvation. He's revealed what He's done. Then it says He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. Now how has God done this? How has He revealed His righteousness, His holiness to all people? Because this psalm shows us very peculiarly and particularly that God loves everyone. This didn't start in John 3.16 where it said God loved the world. From the beginning of the scriptures in the Old Testament all the way through, the message is there. Yes, God has a chosen people. He has those that He's chosen to set His mark on in love, but He loves the whole world. And it says, now how does He reveal His righteousness in the sight of the nations? The next verse gives the answer. He's remembered His loving kindness and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. God has a chosen people whom He loves and whom He shows His faithfulness and whom He shows His loving kindness. And then when He shows that loving kindness and works that loving kindness through His people, then it says, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. How do they see the salvation of our God? When God showed His loving kindness and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. In other words, when God shows His love for us and blesses His people, His chosen ones, that should be something that the world sees. Oh, now I see that God loves. I see the love that He has for His people. This is the simple little pattern that is mentioned here in Psalms, but it's throughout the Scriptures. God has a special chosen people whom he, upon whom He bestows love and faithfulness. And when the world sees that, they say, wow, that God is great. He is the great God. It's through God showing His love and His faithfulness, His loving kindness and His righteousness, showing that to the world through us. And so that's what God has done from page one of the Bible. He shows His favor upon man shows favor upon those he chose, and through that the world sees the salvation of God. That's always been there, as I said, from the beginning. Now in Christ, God takes it to a new dimension. The Christ event, which is the incarnation of Christ, which we call, it's celebrated at Christmas time, then as we go through the events of the passion of Christ and Holy Week and his suffering and his death on the cross, his time spent in Hades, His resurrection from the dead, His ascension, and coming up to the days of Pentecost, all this time is God taking His plan to a higher step. Not only does God show His love to us, you see, now God through Christ empowers us to show, be witnesses of that same love. No longer is it the nation saying, wow, that God really loves His people. Now, God's, the world can say, wow, God's people really love each other. It's not just God loving us anymore. It's us loving God and us loving each other. This becomes the witness to the world. We take the hand of God, as it were, work hand in hand in cooperation with Him. No longer God Himself doing all the demonstration. Now we ourselves show the world the love of God through our lives not just through words, but through actions. Through the incarnation, Christ became one of us. Through His death, 
He became the sacrifice that purified us. And through his ascension, he ascended to the Father so that he could intercede for us and so the Holy Spirit could come and bring us to that extra dimension of being a witness that God calls his people to be. We're not just the recipients of God's love anymore. Now we are the witnesses of God's love to us and to him and to each other. Additionally, what these last three weeks of Easter focus on. These are the first four weeks of Easter focus about the work of Christ, his redeeming work, his empowering all the things that God did for him. When he humbled him. Then God raised him up and gave him a name above every name. We talk about the exaltation of Christ and the power of Christ and how he has cleansed us from our sins and set us apart and called us and chosen us. Then as we come closer to Pentecost in weeks five, six, and seven, we focus more on the Holy Spirit because Easter is not the end of the gospel message. A lot of people start at Christmas and then on Easter Sunday it's done. But there's another step in the work of God. And that step is God empowering his people with the Holy Spirit. That's what the, the Sundays in Easter begin to focus on in the second half of this season. In weeks five, six, and seven, we talk more and more about the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that caps the work of God because through the Holy Spirit, God's people are imbued with power. It's not just Christ anymore. Now, through the Holy Spirit, we're in that anointing and in that power of God. And describe that power pretty much in one simple word. If we even power it, as Jesus said, uh, when the disciples are wondering, are, are you going to are you going to bring the kingdom now? Are you going to take care of the whole world? Are you going to love the whole world now? Are you going to redeem all the world? Jesus said, not time yet for you to know about that. What is time for you to do is you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And that's what the church prepares for these next three weeks or starting last week and this week and the next week. Preparing to receive the power of God. So that what? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you witness of the Messiah anymore. Now the witness of God's people. Showing his power and his love and his character and his righteousness and his loving kindness as he, as he blesses his people. But now he gives it to us so that we can share it with each other and the world. And through this, all nations see the glory of God. The ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. And if we look at the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and if we look at what he does, the, the form that his empowerment takes, we come to... The scriptures today, which every year the sixth season, the sixth Sunday of Easter brings to us. It's the power of love. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit in love. Because it's the Holy Spirit that sheds God's love abroad in our hearts. It's the fruit of that Spirit. When the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is what empowers us by the Holy Spirit to be that witness. The power of the Holy Spirit is not a tingling. It's not a, a, some sort of supernatural thing where we don't think anymore, but God speaks through us. That's fruits of it. That's aspects of it. But the very heart and core and essence of the power of the Holy Spirit is love. The Spirit is all about love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's why in today's Gospel reading, in the middle of... Jesus talking about you shall love me and, and I shall love you, you shall abide in me. All those passages this morning were about love. In the middle of it, in verse 16, in the middle of talking about God's love, he says, then I have called you and appointed you to bear fruit. Why does he suddenly, in the middle of all the talking about love, mention fruit? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the fruit that he says, I've called and appointed you to bear fruit, that's the fruit he wants us to bear. And as we bear that fruit of love, we become that witness to the, each other and to the world. He said, I called you, I chose you, I appointed you. What? That you should go and bear fruit so that you can share in the work of God in revealing God's love and God's kindness and God's faithfulness to the world. 
you share. I, I chose you to share in that ministry that the Father and myself have. The Holy Spirit will come and empower you with my love to be able to do that. And you go and bear fruit, and your fruit should remain. It should stay with you. That's what love does. Love, as, Jesus, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, faith, hope, and love abide, but the, these three, but the one that lasts forever, the greatest, is love. And that's why he says the fruit can remain, because the fruit that remains is the fruit of love. And then after Jesus mentions that and says, bear the fruit, then he says, love one another. He reinforces the point that the Holy Spirit is coming and he's coming to empower us with love so that we can be the witnesses of God's love by sharing God's love, by living God's love, by being God's love, having that essence in our heart. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. This is, as I said, it's, uh, this principle is throughout the Bible, but specifically in the scriptures today, because I said this is the Sunday when the church brings forth and puts in the scriptures and puts in the lectionary so that God's people can hear the importance of the power of God's love. In the gospel reading today, we, we saw it uh, quite strongly. And starting at the beginning of verse 9, the beginning of the gospel reading, he talked about how the Father loved me, I've loved you. Abide in that love. Why? Because that's what's going to make you a witness. You can say all sorts of nice words, you can put on all sorts of nice shows, but it's your love that makes you the witness. Or more importantly, more correctly, God's love in you that makes you that witness. Then he says... If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. That love will last. That fruit will remain. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in Him. Then He reminds us in verse 12, what is that love? This is my commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you. Why? Because when we love each other, we're going to be that witness to the nations. And all the world shall see the salvation of God. And the whole world, is, as God promises, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It happens when the world sees God's love. Amen. Also in 1 John, we see the very same, very same message. That's why in, uh, in the first reading this morning, it was the book of Acts talking about how God sent the Holy Spirit and how then they were saying, well, if these, the Gentiles, those who weren't part of the group, the believers, weren't part of God's chosen. They've received the Holy Spirit. Now we've got to make sure they get water and be baptized because now they're part of us. But again, it shows how the Holy Spirit brings the Word of God, not just to the chosen group anymore, but now to all the nations. All the nations can see. Uh, they saw, because Peter, when he was given that dream and that vision, he didn't just like hop on a bus and take a couple of minutes trip to, uh, to where, to where uh, Cornelius was. It was a long trip, probably more than 24 hours. It took a lot out, you know, it was an effort from him. And yet Cornelius, maybe more than the words that Peter spoke, Cornelius saw the effort of Peter. There's somebody that the Lord wants me to speak to. I love the Lord, I'm going to go do that. It was Peter's effort that Cornelius saw that had something to do probably with his being open to the Word of God. But getting back to 1 John, he also shows us the power and the uh, central role in the kingdom of God of love. When he says, whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, whoever loves the Father, loves the child born of Him. Now we talk about when we love God, we love each other. We love the children born of God. We love the children of God. But then he's, or we love those who have been born again. But in the second verse, by this we know we love the children of God. How many of you are children of God? How many of you believe that your bus driver or jeepney driver, whoever got you here this morning, was one of the children of God? How many of you believe that when you go to the market and buy vegetables, your gulai vendor is one of the children of God? How many of you have ever met someone who was not a child of God? Because we're all children of God, right? Amen. We're not all born again, but when... John says here, we love the children of God. He takes it out of the realm just of church people, not just us. He's going beyond and says, you love the children of God. You love everyone God created. And that's, I'm the hot and towel. No one's left out of the children of God. 
Not all are in that realm we call born again and chosen at this point, but the day is coming when all will be. And that's what we're about as a church. So he says, we love the children of God. How do we know that we love all those people out there? When we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandment is not burdensome. And again, what is his commandment? That we love one another and love God. And in that, and, and love just pretty much as, as he said here, love the children of God. That's each. His commandment, love God, love each other. So you see the, the importance of this. And now this is beginning to sound kind of like a children's cartoon, right? I love you, you love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? You know, at this point, it's like, okay, that's nice. But that's what my kids watch on Saturday morning. Big deal. Because when we hear the word love, sometimes we get sort of stuck into that concept of love. But when Jesus says, love one another, and this is my commandment, that you love one another, and that you love God and believe in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, his kind of love is a bit deeper than the kind of love that we often see and hear about. Much deeper. It's, first of all, it's love that comes with a price. It's love that comes with a cost. It's not just something that is there to bless me. Oh, I want to have somebody to love so that they can love me and make me feel good. That's as far as most of us get. But the love of God has a deeper dimension to it. That's why it says in the, in the second reading in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with water and the blood. See, water's cheap. Water is, uh, you know, not a very great deal. It's very common, very, uh, you know, it's everywhere. Blood, on the other hand, is something more precious. Water is not intimidating. You know, you can be all surrounded by water. You don't see very many people that are afraid of water, right? Ah, duck off, I'm too big. <laughs> not very common. But you are, there are a lot of people that are afraid of blood. There are many people who wanted to go to medical school and be a doctor, but they flunked out after the first quarter because the sight of blood terrified them. Ah, the cough, the gall. Blood is intimidating because blood, often if you see blood outside the body, there's been some suffering involved to get it out there. You don't usually bleed without there being some pain involved. Blood, when, when, when John said, it's not just water, it's not just the abundant blessing and showers of blessings and all that. There's blood involved. There's suffering involved. There's pain involved. There's, it's not just all so easy. And he said, love involves that. That's what Christ came with. Not just water, but with the blood. Jesus himself said in, in the gospel reading, right in the middle of all these things about love, he's talking about love, talking about love. Then he says, Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. See, love has a cost. It's not free. It's not easy. There's no such thing as free love. There's no such thing as easy love. That's what the world has, and it's not really God's love. And this is the love that the Holy Spirit empowers us with. The power of love that comes with a little bit of suffering involved, maybe pain involved. We would call it taking up our cross, self-sacrifice, not always just wanting things our way. But love will look to the greater good and the good of others. It's love with a cost. What Jesus talks about here when he says, no greater love has anyone than to give up his life for his friends. That is the greatest love. I'm sorry about the song that came out in the 90s and says, the greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. That's one of the most popular songs on the radio 30 years later. And it's one of the most anti-Christian songs in the world. If it's one of your favorite songs, I'm sorry. Nice tune. The lady that sung it, you know, she, she had some pipes. She could sing. But if you look at her life, she wasn't very happy. I was, now I'm not picking on her or anything. Sorry I said that. But the point is, that's not the greatest love of all. The greatest love of all is not learning to love yourself. The greatest love of all is learning to love God and love our neighbor as ourself and learn to know what real love is, which has a certain element of sacrifice. This kind of love is what I would call loving the Jesus way. 
Because Jesus' love is not just for us. See, that's what makes Jesus' love the step beyond. We're not just loving those like us. It's not just, I love you, you love me, we're all one family together and all that. Jesus' love loves his enemies as well. This is the, what a major part of the Sermon on the Mount was about. In chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was talking about this and he said, you know, in this life, there's some people that are going to hurt you. They're going to afflict you. They're going to come at you. And the first thing he said, what you've always heard is payback. What they do to you, you do to them. He said, that's not my love. If we're talking about love today, a love that transforms nations, a love that evangelizes the world, it's a love that says, you've struck me on this cheek? Here, take this one. See, that's love that suffers. That's love that comes not just with water, but with the blood. Or if you're going to take me to court and sue me and take my shirt, take my share of the inheritance, take whatever is rightfully mine, okay, love, take my coat too. That's love that suffers. That's Christ's love. That's Jesus' love. As when, they, when the Roman soldiers, and they could do this legally, force you to carry their pack for one mile, that's some suffering. It's hot in the summer in that particular area of the world. It's tough. But when they're uh, asking you to go that one mile, you go with them too. That's love that suffers. That's the Jesus love. And that's the love that transforms nations. That's the love the world will see and go, there's something going on there. There's something powerful there. And after, after those verses, same context, he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I'm telling you, love your enemies. Love those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's Jesus' love. That's the love we're talking about today. Not just the love for us, but love for all. Because if we love like God loved, God loved the world. And his desire is for the nations to see his loving kindness and his faithfulness and his righteousness. That's what he desires. And that's what he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to do. It takes power. That's why it's called power of the Holy Spirit. If it was easy, if it was easy love, if it was free love, you wouldn't really need the Holy Spirit to have it because it comes naturally kind of that way. But to have this Jesus kind of love that goes beyond and loves the enemies, that takes the power of the Holy Spirit. One other place this morning which I'll go to and share about how this Jesus love works. Again in the Sermon on the Mount, a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. When Jesus says, first of all, if you really love each other and you see your brother might have a little problem. Might be something he doesn't see the same way you see it. That's why you're in your church, he's in his church. You're both in church, you both love the Lord, but you're not too sure about each other. He does this baptism that way. We do our baptism this way. Or one of a million other little theological things that cause people to separate. Jesus said, you really love him? Don't go and try to dig the speck out of his eye. You've got to learn how to baptize people or Jesus will never, ever love you. God will never bring you into the kingdom of God. Let me get that speck out of your eye. He's just sitting there with the finger in the guy's eye and he's like, ah, ah, ah. And he's probably going, where is the love? You know, this, Jesus said, that's not the way you love each other. He says, when you're talking about each other, you don't pick apart each other's theology. You don't pick apart your beliefs. You know, Scripture says the Lord will show people. Sooner or later, the Lord will show. You might be the one he shows, oh, you need to change your thinking a little bit. You never know. Sometimes we're so sure we think we're right because there's a principle from psychology, which is actually true. Everybody thinks they're right. There's nobody that thinks, I'm wrong. I just don't want to change my mind. Everybody, by the time they reach a certain age, has come to the idea and the conclusion, I'm right about this. And, you know, fine. The Lord has the power to convict and to change, and he does. But in the process, what Jesus says here is, if you really love each other, it's a good idea to keep your finger out of each other's eye and take away the pointing finger. You got it wrong. You got it wrong. You got a little moat there, a little tiny speck. Here, let me get it for you. Ah, ah. He says that's the way you be careful of how you treat each other. He said, if your brother has a moat in his eye, but then he goes further, the next verse, which is just an illustration of this one. And this was in our uh, daily office readings, or this week. 
And it really like, wow, it really just came out of me like never before. I never really got this verse when he says, don't cast your pearls before swine. I never really got that until I sort of understood that it's an illustration of what he said before about the moat and the law. But this time he says, if a, if a pig is out there, he says, don't th throw your pearls before pigs. Now when he's talking about pigs, he's not talking about brothers and sisters anymore. That's just a biblical way of talking about the world, the, the, the heathen, if you want to say that, the unbelievers. So don't get too stuck on, bye boy, bye boy. Just remember, he's talking about unbelievers. He says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Now, what is he saying? Pearls always have to do with the kingdom of God. Actually, a pearl is the only gemstone that comes through suffering because there's a little grain of sand inside the oyster and he keeps secreting a fluid to try to wash it out. That fluid eventually hardens and becomes a pearl. And so it's talking about kingdom love is really what it's talking about. That suffering, that love of Christ, which causes some lack of discomfort. And when Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine, there's all sorts of good, you know, things of the kingdom, principles of the kingdom. But he said, when you're talking to swine, to unbelievers, don't throw them at them. 